Welcome to a lecture on septal lines. My name is Jeff Galvin. Uh, I'm a professor uh, in the departments of radiology and internal medicine pulmonary division. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about septal lines. The talk itself is called tackling perilymphatic disease, but we're really gonna focus on the septa themselves and the lymphatics within them because it is those two structures that tell us a lot about the diseases that we are looking at. So let's take one minute and talk about uh, the lymphatics. Originally discovered by Chapnell in the 50s, uh, these are his original injections, which you see on the left here. This is the pleural surface of the lung. He was the first one to show uh, that there were valves with it, one way valves within the lymphatics and helped explain uh, the direction of lymphatic flow. We know that there are two sets, one that starts in the pleura, second sets that starts along the bronchovascular bundles. We're gonna be concerned primarily with those along the pleura. If we look at his original injections, we will see that the lymphatics have to find a way into the lung and they do so through the intralobular septum, these Curly's lines that you can see here. We can see the lymphatics going through them, attaching to a pulmonary vein and working their way into the center of the mediastinum. So uh, it is the interaction between the lymphatics and uh, the surrounding material, which tells us something about the diseases that we're going to talk about. The other point I want to try to make is that uh, when you inhale something, whether it be a, a noxious element, a particle, usually less than a couple of microns, a bacterium, it's going to tend to fall within the center of the secondary lobule, and then it's going to get cleared both centrally and peripherally, uh, and it's going to create a pattern which you and I would recognize as a lymphatic pattern, uh, meaning that we know that there are lymphatics in the center of the secondary lobule, we know that there are lymphatics in the periphery, there are no lymphatics within the alveolar walls themselves. So there's a mechanical motion which moves this material both centrally and peripherally. And then we get reactions in the periphery of the secondary lobule and in the center portion of the secondary lobule. Classic is sarcoidosis. We know this is an antigen of some sort in a very small amount. Uh, whatever we inhale gets brought centrally. So we tend to see nodules along the bronchovascular bundles. We see nodules and thickening along the intralobular septa, a combination of uh, fibrosis and granuloma. So complete secondary lobules here, we see it both in typical sarcoidosis. We're gonna talk about the septa themselves. And I think there are basically three common uh, abnormalities that cause us to see septal lines. One is edema, fluid. Second is fibrosis. And the third is tumor. The most common uh, edema is going to be the post-capillary obstruction, usually associated with a failing left ventricle. Uh, but recognize that you can get edema of the secondary lobule anywhere from the left ventricle all the way out to the pulmonary vein. So let's look at classic congestive heart failure, uh, big left ventricle, lots of septal lines. Notice, and this helps me uh, substantially, and that is look at the corner of the intralobular septa and see that the pulmonary veins are big. So it suggests, again, that this is uh, increased pressure uh, either on the left side of the heart or could be mitral stenosis, um, uh, less likely something within the atrium. If you give somebody di uh, diuretic, you can see how the pulmonary veins themselves get smaller and the septal lines disappear. So classic congestive heart failure, left ventricular dysfunction. So as we said, anywhere along uh, from the left ventricle to the uh, mitral valve to the left atrium, it could be central pulmonary veins. If somebody has arrhythmias and they've done an ablation and they narrow those veins, all of them could cause obstruction of blood flow trying to move back to the left atrium, at which point you and I may see edema of the septal lines. It can also occur if you have pulmonary vein stenosis in the periphery so-called pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, a disease of unclear etiology in which you have destruction of veins in the periphery of the secondary lobule. And as a consequence, because it's post-capillary, we are going to see septal lines. The pulmonary veins themselves are usually not large. The person tends to present late within the disease. Uh, the left ventricle is normal, the left atrium is normal. So we know the obstruction is proximal to this. In this case, 
the septal lines, which we see here both on the gross and on the imaging, is caused by narrowing of this pulmonary vein. So septal line, we can see that on the histology. Within the, sept within the septum, there are pulmonary veins. If we enlarge that pulmonary vein, we can see that there is intimal fibrosis. Uh, and so as there is fibrosis and narrowing of the vein, you start to get increased pressure within the pulmonary venous circuit. And that increased pressure causes there to be fluid, which oozes out into the interlobular septa. It also increases back pressure. Also recognize that it may not just be narrowing, but you can get complete thrombosis of the pulmonary veins. Uh, a nice uh, set of pictures to explain this. This is the periphery of the secondary lobule. This is the pulmonary vein within the interlobular septum. We see the lymphatics in addition. So some combination of thrombosis and narrowing of the pulmonary vein causes there to be fluid, which oozes out with into the interlobular septum. It also increases back pressure uh, into the capillaries. So we see edema, both of the interlobular septum. We may see that also of the alveolar walls, and you may see that the capillaries themselves become engorged. But not all of septal line prominence as edema is related to increased pressure. Sometimes it could be that there is actual damage to the capillaries themselves. The classic capillary leak is acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Here, the hydrostatic pressure is normal, but you have abnormalities of uh, the capillaries due to eosinophils around them. This was a case of a 37-year-old, and we got to see the histology from this. Uh, he was a photographer that was working for the Army and flew into the Middle East um, under some strain, I guess, he began to smoke cigarettes for the very first time within 48 hours, was very short of breath, had to be intubated in the field. We can see septal lines in the periphery here. Uh, and those same septal lines beautifully seen on the coronal image here. There are areas of consolidation, areas of ground glass. Uh, and we see that the pulmonary veins are normal. So this is uh, related to actual damage to the capillaries and oozing of fluid. Also not surprising, these people, 100% of them will have pleural fluid, uh, which, uh, which is bilateral. And not surprisingly, it may also involve the bronchovascular bundle where the lymphatics also are. On open lung biopsy, he's got eosinophils, not a surprise. And within eosinophils, we know there's a material called major basic protein, and it tends to cause holes in the capillaries, and so you get the typical oozing throughout there. This is an acute process. Um, patients are hypoxemic. Obviously, they have uh, eosinophils on open lung biopsy and bronchoalveolar lavage. Uh, unlike ARDS, they respond promptly to steroids. The typical findings are going to be septal lines, which are everywhere, pleural effusions, areas of ground glass, and consolidation. Now, if you have abnormalities in the lung that are there long enough, edema and inflammation, then you can get fibrosis of the intralobular septa. And there are a number of uh, abnormalities within the chest, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, organizing pneumonia, chronic congestive heart failure, hemorrhage, sarcoidosis, all of them can result in fibrosis of the intralobular septa. Classic pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, crazy paving pattern, has a wide differential. Um, certainly infection, hemorrhage, uh, diffuse alveolar damage are all within the differential. But this is a case of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. We know that these patients have a paucity of granulocyte macrophage colonase stimulating factor. Their macrophages don't work well. And as a consequence, they have too much surfactant-like material. And this surfactant-like material in, in, in the lung causes increase in flow within the lymphatics, and there is fluid within the interlobular septa, which is what gives us this crazy paving pattern. Recognize, however, if the pulmonary alveolar proteinosis sticks around for a long time, then there is progression to fibrosis. Now we can see that the interlobular septum here is indeed fibrotic. Now, one of the most common causes that I see that cause septal lines in general, both edematous and fibrotic, is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. If somebody says organizing pneumonia to me, I think it's the beginning of the workup. Organizing pneumonia is not a disease, it's a common response, most likely to infection, diffuse alveolar damage, hemorrhage, connective tissue disease, drug reaction, and a, a fair number of these people get better 
but they usually don't clear completely. Uh, and off of them, there may be prolonged problems. This is organization, organizing material within the alveolar spaces. Now, one of the things to recognize is that almost all people with organizing pneumonia will end up having septal lines. They have areas of consolidation because of the organization, but they always, because of whatever else is going on here, this white line is an edematous intralobular septa. This is a markedly dilated lymphatic. And over time, this pr process, if it is not dealt with, uh, will turn into fibrosis. You can see here, instead of having a white line, you now have a pink fibrotic line. So fibrous uh, involvement of the intralobular septa is common. And they are part of what causes the arcade formation, which you and I are well familiar with, beautiful arcades in this patient with organizing pneumonia, consolidation and organization, septal lines here, all related to the fact of whatever the initial injury was. This is a patient with smoking related diffuse uh, lung disease and organization, dead ringer for pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. In this case, how, we don't see PAP, we see smokers macrophages, we see organization, and this combination of inflammation results in edematous and fibrotic interlobular septa. This was a case that I thought was pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, but recognize that organizing pneumonia and uh, smokers with severe diffuse lung disease can present in a similar way. Here we can see a lot of organization, that pale material, again, with septal lines within it. Now, one of the other things to recognize the people who have chronic congestive heart failure uh, often have hemorrhage and organization and have diffuse pulmonary fibrosis. This was one patient who went to open lung biopsy for concern for fibrosis. It's a long history of severe uh, chronic congestive heart failure, septal lines, ground glass opacity, redistribution of vascular flow. And if we look at his open lung biopsy, we can see that there are fibrotic alveolar walls that give us this ground glass opacity. But what I want you to look at is not only is there fibrosis, but these are hemosiderin laden macrophages. Let's take a closer look at them. This is right at the periphery. Here we can see that there's an intralobular septum. And if we take a biopsy there, you can see these are hemosiderin laden macrophages from the chronic hemorrhage related to the increased pressure within the pulmonary vessels. And this material is, is making its way into the pleura, and we can see that it is diapodesing within here. So you have pleural edema, you have intralobular uh, septal thickening, and the lymphatics are dilated. And look how dilated this lymphatic is. And it's one of the reasons why we have this nodularity along the peripheral pleural surface. That brings us finally to lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Uh, this was an unfortunate 30-year-old uh, who had gastric cancer. Here we get, again see uh, septal lines, which are in the periphery within the lung, uh, striking septal lines, and also central lobular densities, uh, which are too great. Uh, this is a very nice correlation of this intralobular septum, which is fibrotic. We can see tumor, which is within the lymphatics. And the reason that the intralobular septa is so well seen is you have a fibrotic response to the adenocarcinoma, which is within the intralobular septa. We've seen the same sort of thing within the center of the secondary lobule. You can also see that the lymphatics around the pulmonary veins are markedly uh, uh, involved. And as a consequence, you have thickening of the pulmonary veins here. This is all tumor within the interlobular septum. The center of the secondary lobule has the same effect. We have tumor, which is following along the bronchovascular bundles within the lymphatics, which surround it. And to recognize that tumor in the lymphatics actually starts out as embolization of tumor into the pulmonary vessels. This is a dilated pulmonary vessel within the lung. We have intravascular tumor, which is then working its way into the lymphatics around the vessel. So lymphangitic carcinomatosis, usually we don't make the diagnosis early on. Uh, most common primaries, breast, lung, stomach, pancreas, and prostate, and it starts with hemostrogenous spread. So what I wanted to try to do for you was to give you a walkthrough for central Lyme uh, predominance. Uh, and it turns out that the, the things to think about are edema, fibrosis with prolonged inflammation, and finally, tumor. Uh, sorry for the typo. Uh, sorry we can't all be together. Uh, hopefully we'll sometime in the future. Thank you very much.